Okay, so have you ever experienced kindness from other people? Um, who gave it to you? Uh, was it a loved one or a stranger? Like, what did they do? How this event, how this interaction made you feel? And how old is this memory? For how long do you carry this kindness with you? And have you ever done anything that was kind? Mm, think about it for a moment. What was it? How it made you feel? Was the feeling pleasant or not? These and similar questions um, I ask together with Professor Joanna Szafran from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland in our investigations regarding kindness. Because believe it or not, but kindness is a vastly underexplored topic. It seems so intuitive and so natural in many ways. So obvious, yet like with many other things in science, the deeper you dig into the topic, the less obvious it gets. And the easier it is to actually get curious about how different people see it, how different people, well, do it, <laughs> and how differently they feel it. And I started investigating kindness because it seems like a, <laughs> such a simple and elegant solution to many of humanity's problems. Mm, because when you think about it, an act of kindness may be a starting point for a new connection. It can be a very important step towards strengthening uh, a connection that already exists. And from my experience at least, it has the power to repair and to give hope. I think it also may, it has the power to make us feel seen, regardless if we are the ones who show or the ones who receive kindness. And at the moment when it takes place, both actors seem to be in the very center of each other's attention. And as you maybe are lucky enough to know from your own experience, this is a very powerful one and can be possibly life-changing. So what is kindness really? What's the definition? Well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> because philosophers, saints, poets, and scientists have different opinions about what it is. Some thinkers and researchers understand kindness as an individual trait a part of our character. Some will place it in the category of attitudes. So something that is a part of our general attitude towards others or life. Some will say that this is a social competence and others almost exclusively see it as a prosocial behavior. There are also those who say this is a virtue or a value. So there is no consensus really also on the intentionality of kind behavior, its motives and context, or a set of its determinants. All of this is beyond 
agreement for now. It can be dependent on the cultural background of the actors also, because those philosophers, saints and poets from all around the world will probably have different definitions of kindness just because of the different experiences and cultural background they have. And this is why in my scientific work on kindness, I decided together with Joanna to um, kind of take a step back and see what is out there, how our human definitions of kindness are created, how we see it, um, and how the age, the developmental stage differ, how we approach kindness. So in our research, we focused on students and young adults up to 25 and the core beliefs they have about kindness. And here, it seems to be actually quite consistent so far. <laughs> we don't have all the most recent uh, findings analyzed yet. But what is striking is that, that all of them or most of them mention that kindness is something that is nice, good, helpful. And that is, is something that we do towards others. For this moment of kindness, we transgress our own self and we are focused on the other person and their needs. So it kind of takes us out of ourself in a good way. And this is why I think many of our respondents in our research underline that kindness is a selfless act of care. And I really like those views. One thing is because they are formulated by, well, from my point of view, a younger generation that soon is going to well, take over the world. So it's good that they see kindness as such. But I also find hope in how they formulate those definition because I think that with all the things that are going on right now all around the world with many scary and heartbreaking things happening, we really need people to care. And I am glad that they say they do. And there is another player <laughs> in the recent world. And I also asked for the sake of this presentation, I asked also this new hmm, entity uh, about what kindness is. I asked AI how it would define kindness. And I received an amazing answer. I think it's actually one of my favorite definition of kindness that I, of all that I found so far, because uh, it said that kindness is an intentional and voluntary act of benefiting others without expecting anything in return, motivated by compassion, empathy, or or concern for their well-being. It involves genuine care and consideration for others, regardless of their background, beliefs, or circumstances. And I think that in today's world, with this rapid technological progress, talking to AI about kindness might be as important as talking to our children about it. Because if we will soon source information and solve problems with AI, this is the data scientist in me speaking, maybe it would be good to have this conversation, not only among people. But coming back to the definition, I will allow myself to use the one that I just said as our definition of kindness for sake of today's conversation. What is amazing about kindness is that it seems 
as I said before, so natural, organic. If I would ask you about ask of act of kindness you remember from last week that you witnessed or you yourself performed, probably you would also similarly like my respondents in the study would you would give examples of pretty simple things like saying a nice words to somebody, um, letting a pregnant woman sit in a tram <laughs> or uh, picking up old ladies grocery, uh, something that seems such a simple behavior, let, yet it has ha, amazingly vast benefits. And those benefits are actually very well investigated, um, especially when it comes to effects that kindness have on those who give. So there are a number of studies on kindness that suggest that it has positive impact on our mental and physical health. Being kind improves significantly our well-being. Uh, being intentionally kind to others and noticing kindness in their behavior has positive impact on uh, our mental health. It reduces symptoms of depression, increases subjective levels of happiness, it improves life satisfaction, uh, increases longevity even. There are amazing research on elderly volunteers and it shows that the meaningful acts that they perform as volunteers actually helps them to stay healthy for a longer time. It also slows down the aging process. Um, and uh, it does all of the magical things you actually see right now in the slide. So it can increase your self-esteem. It can increase your empathy and compassion and it can improve your mood. It affects directly your body. It affects your blood pressure, uh, st uh, mm, stress hormone levels and others. <laughs> it stimulates your immune responses and it boosts serotonin and dopamine. No matter at what area of life you look, kindness probably has a positive impact on it. Its power seems to be almost limitless. So before I go any further, I would like to invite you to a little exercise. And I would like you to try to answer a few questions for yourself. And I, on purpose, I will ask them now before I will give you some suggestions on how they might be answered. Maybe mainly because of what you see that Carl Rogers said. He was a renowned psychologist. Uh, and this quote, what is most personal is most universal. I think it was my motto for a very long time while I was actually uh, actively practicing because I really believe that deep, deep down inside, we are all very alike and we crave pretty similar things. You probably know all that I'm saying right now and you will probably know also answers to these questions because we all know kindness, either as givers or as those who have experienced receiving it. All I would like us to do is to kind of bring back those memories and the awareness of the experience, because I think it might be useful for our conversation about kindness. So try answering those questions. You can do it in your mind, <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, you can also write it on your phone, on a piece of paper, or open a file on uh, your computer. Uh, but you don't need to type these answers, actually, now when I think about it. Uh, you can write down the questions and take them with you. Um, and maybe this is a better approach even, because 
answers to these questions, they may change because we change. Days are different. Needs are different. But the questions will remain valid probably for a longer time. And uh, idealists in me would say that they may even last forever. So how do you know that someone is being kind to you? How do you recognize it? What's your hint? What are your favorite ways to show kindness? To yourself, very important, but also how you show kindness to others. What is your favorite way to receive kindness when you are someone who has this experience of being taken care of? What is the favorite kind of kindness for you. And when you think about someone that is close to you, it can be a spouse, a partner, it can be your child, or maybe your pet, parent, a friend. If you think about any of those people or all of them, do you know how they like to receive kindness? What is the way they prefer? How they like kindness to be showed to them? Give it some thought and let it sink in. Because I think that this is the very first step of, of performing kindness in a way that is really beneficial, that goes beyond our fantasy of what is needed, but can be actually a part of conversation between us and our close ones. So whenever you have the time, take those questions and think about them a bit. Maybe it will be useful. But if we would like to create a recipe for kindness, and I've been thinking about it for a while, uh, and also, I was trying to think about the most universal way. And I think that the very first step is to pay attention. Um, it's not easy because we have very fast pacing world and we often rush. We are almost always in the middle of something or in between. And I think we are slowly losing the ability to stop. And I think that to pay attention really well, to pay it truly, <laughs> we need to stop. Because when you think about it, to look at something really closely, to actually see it, you need to stop and you need to put away your phone. <laughs> you need to look it straight in the eye, be close enough to not only have a glimpse, but actually investigate the details. And this stopping is a necessary part of another thing. 
because I think that it creates space. It creates a certain silence that makes it possible for the other person to talk without interruptions. And it makes it possible for us to listen. And listening is a very difficult thing to do because we are also very used to reacting. We are very used to giving opinions. And in the moments when kindness is needed, it is very often not about our opinion. It's about this space for the other person. And it is about us listening to understand. And there is this famous quote, and I admit that right now, I just cannot remember who actually said it. But there is this um, phrase that currently people often listen not to understand, but to reply. So I would really, really uh, encourage you to listen. And if you need to talk <laughs> during this time, I think the, the good thing to do is ask. Because asking questions not only shows that we are genuinely interested, but also helps us actually understand what other person needs. We have this tendency to give advice or try to fix things because we are not too good with discomfort when other person is in need is in a difficult situation it is often very hard to carry it because we feel those emotions too we are affected by them and if we are talking about a person in need that requires care and kindness very often <laughs> we also feel like it's, it's hard for us, even though we experience those things only by proxy. So I would encourage you to keep your focus, try to understand and ask. And also remember about questions like, is there anything you need right now? Is there anything that I can do? And if a person says yes, do exactly this. Because I think that we have also this tendency to rely very often on our fantasies. When in fact, the person in front of us can need something very different from what we might be imagining. So ask, what do you need? What can I do? And they do what they tell you. And this is very difficult if you think about it. Because again, we are very often taught to be fixers, but we are rarely taught to be present. And when I think about moments when I need kindness or most recent events when my friends needed it, the most often the request is just sit here with me and hold my hand. And this is sometimes the most difficult thing and the one that it's really worth doing. Because this being present is something that actually affects us 
on a very deep level. And even though sometimes it's hard to believe that our presence alone can do anything good, but believe me, it does. And actually, there's even research to prove it. Uh, there is this amazing study that I, I think I quote every time I talk to anybody. But uh, reading about this uh, research and results it brought actually changed my way of thinking about many things. So there is this study by James Cohen and his colleagues. And in this study, there were three experimental conditions. Subjects could receive a low intensity electric shock while alone in the presence of a stranger or in the presence of a loved one. Uh, those in, in, they were all in a scanner. So, um, because the goal was to investigate whether there are any neural structures or networks that become active when we receive social support. And the results were that those in satisfying relationships showed less activation of a network associated with responding to a threatening situation, while those in less satisfying relationships showed increased activation in areas associated with release of stress hormones. In the presence of a stranger, the stress reaction was even more pronounced. Um, and it intensified uh, when the person experienced the electric shock while they were alone. So this shows that the brain's threat response is reduced when a high quality partner, a friend is nearby and that it takes effort to cope when only a stranger is available and it's most costly uh, when we are forced to cope alone. But in this experiment, the only thing that the accompanying person was doing was being present. So imagine people who were electrocuted were in a new situation in a setting they did not know. And the only thing that affected, affected their brain's response was the presence of someone they trusted and loved. And in the times that are difficult, your presence probably is doing the very same thing for someone you love. But just to be fair, this is not always easy. Paying attention to others and acting on it requires a true cognitive and emotional effort. Despite common belief, true kindness is not easy. It requires our engagement. In the moments when we are tired, overwhelmed, stressed, being kind to ourselves and to others can be a challenge. So after talking about being kind to others for almost half an hour now, I just want to give a bit of a caveat and a reminder for you to be kind to yourself too because everything starts with you. The kinder you are to yourself, the kinder you will be to others. So I hope you will go back to the questions that I mentioned before and think about how you can be kind to yourself. Then try it out <laughs> and find your own way. And then take this experience of love, softness, gentleness, vulnerability and use it and pass it forward and create a ripple. Thank you.